Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to CDT's Future of Speech Online. We are still getting folks in from the waiting room, so if you'll bear with us just a minute or two, we will get started momentarily. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Ashkin Kazari, and I'm very excited to be here and to welcome you to the seventh annual Future of Online Speech Conference. On behalf of Stand Together, I wanted to express our gratitude to CDT for partnering with us on this important event, especially um, in such an important time when we're talking about the intersection of speech and algorithms. In the past seven years, uh, the landscape of online speech has undergone significant turbulence and challenges. We've witnessed legislative attempts around the world uh, to regulate and shelf and shape the digital realm. Um, we've witnessed um, different countries taking different approaches and copycatting each other's approaches in an attempt to make the internet in the way that they want it to be. Uh, and in accordance with the values that they have. Uh, amidst all of this, my colleagues at Stand Together and I remain optimistic about the future of free speech and the positive role that technology plays in our lives. It's that optimism and belief in people and the values uh, of the American democracy uh, that drives us to foster partnerships and provide grants and engage in dialogue with policymakers, media, uh, thought leaders uh, on our vision of the future. In the United States, it would be unfair to not mention that there are a lot of division and eroding trust and rise of censorship. And we're aware, uh, aware of all the threats to free speech that exist. Um, but we at the same time believe that defending it um, is the way to the future of a diverse uh, and peaceful society. And there's hope. America has always had strength in its diversity of views. It's that diversity that has fueled the country's success and allows us to find new and better paths forward. So diversity that brought me over from all the way from Russia as an adult because I wanted to be part of the society and contribute to it. So let's talk about the new kid on the block, algorithms. They have been all across headlines and in dinner table conversations. Uh, there is a lot of confusion about what algorithms are and how they work and what exactly we mean when we say regulating AI. And the confusion exists all the way from those dinner tables to the US Congress. I think one important thing to know um, about how Stand Together thinks about algorithms is that we ground all those conversations in the industries and policy areas that they apply to. So might that be education, 
or labor, immigration, judicial and legal system, we think of algorithms in that context. Um, I was also thinking about this new you know, chapter in the technology development and policy discussions that we're having as a society. And it felt significantly different from the conversations we were even having 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and 10 years ago. And for a while, I couldn't pin my finger on why exactly that was. Um, and, and then it hit me. I think the, the difference between the conversations we've had, let's say around regulating for user content online and uh, liability of platforms and the conversations we're having about um, generative AI, um, the, the piece that's missing in the generative AI conversations often is the human piece. Um, we can have all these big battles about if platforms should be liable for, for user speech or not. But we're talking about human speech. And then when we're talking about AI, it's such an uncharted territory that often we end up thinking of pop culture and books and movies and Skynet that is what shaped our understanding of it for all these years. Um, so that's, I think, the, the big difference uh, when we're trying to have these policy conversations. And as we delve deeper into them, um, let's remember that the main guiding light, at least in, in our opinion at Stand Together, is the civil liberties and making them paramount to every conversation, every dialogue, any, every collaboration. Um, there should be commitment to protecting rights uh, as we navigate these uncharted waters of technology to emerge stronger as a society and uphold all the values uh, of free speech and diversity and unity. Uh, with that, I want to again thank everyone for uh, joining us, and I want to thank CDT for having these important conversations, because the answer isn't clear, but thoughtful uh, civil uh, society debate is what's going to guide us there. Um, I want to introduce Emma Lanzo, Director of CDT's Free Expression Project, uh, to lead us into the next session. Great, thank you so much, Ash. We really appreciate all of your work over the years in this field and Stand Together's continued support for this event. Um, just a few quick housekeeping notes for folks before we get started. We are recording and live streaming all of these sessions on CDT's YouTube page, youtube.com slash sendemtech, so you can catch up on any sessions that you missed. Um, today's event is public and on the record, and we're taking audience questions throughout the sessions, either through the Zoom Q&A, or if you're following the live stream, you can submit questions via email to questions at cdt.org. And now I'm really excited to introduce our speakers for today's first panel, In Search of Best Practices. Um, during yesterday's sessions, we got in, an introduction to the basics of how generative AI systems work and some of the big questions that are coming up about how these tools and systems may affect our societies, especially in the context of upcoming elections around the world in 2024. Today, we're gonna dig further into the question, what can be done about all of this? Um, and think about the role and development of best practices and liability and accountability frameworks for generative AI. This panel is all about those best practices. What are they or what might they be? Who is developing them? How are we thinking about managing risk and guiding the fields towards responsible AI innovation? So joining us for that discussion today are Nicholas Lundblad, the Director of Public Policy at Google DeepMind, Nazneen Rajani, a Research Lead at Hugging Face, Elham Tabasi, a senior research scientist at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and Dave Wilner, a non-resident fellow at Stanford's Program on Governance of Emerging Technologies, and the former, and I believe first, head of trust and safety at OpenAI. Um, so let's dive right in, because I think we have a lot to talk about, um, and I'm eager to, to get the conversation started. Um, so Nazneen, maybe I'll come to you first uh, to just give us a little bit of framing. When we talk about risk in generative AI systems, what kinds of risks are we talking about? Can you give us some examples of safety risks or issues that have kind of caught the public's attention? Sure, yeah. So uh, am I audible okay? Awesome, yeah. So I think the way I see it is that, you know, broadly to could think of them as two types of risk. Uh, the first one is the so social risk. And then the second one is enterprise risk or the risk that these businesses face 
Um, for example, like, you know, an example of social risk is future of work. What does the future of jobs look like? Uh, is generative AI going to replace work, augment humans? Like, there's just so many open questions. Um, uh, you know, an example is like, there's a startup that just got funded to build end-to-end -end software systems and software applications using just generative AI. So essentially, basically just, you know, and they got a lot of funding like close to um, 200 to 300 million dollars and to just build that whole uh, generative AI, like a very powerful model that would essentially just replace software engineers in the future. So that is definitely one of the risks that, you know, is on the table. Um, there's obviously like, you know, risks on disinformation, especially with the upcoming elections. Um, that's like, you know, a big risk. Um, the second one is um, role playing. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of these startups like Character AI, and now we last week we saw Meta's announcement of these AI agents that will be part of like WhatsApp, Messenger, um, and Instagram chat, which will essentially be like, you know, a companion. And uh, once we start having that, I feel a lot of people will start confiding in these agents. Um, they would start sharing potentially confidential information. Um, and, you know, maybe they should or shouldn't be sharing that. And, you know, there could be ways that these agents can manipulate humans to get information from them, uh, which I think is, again, like, you know, a very real risk. Um, on the other hand, on the enterprise side, we have risk that, you know, because these companies are giving their proprietary data to fine tune these LLMs and they seem to work really well, they're fine, like, you know, just giving more and more data, which is essentially customer data. And there's a big risk that, you know, some of this might get leaked. Like imagine in healthcare, like leaking PII information or in finance leaking PCI information, right? SSNs, credit card information, and so on. Um, those are like, again, real lists, obviously, like the so-called hallucination, which is like just giving wrong information um, is another type of risk that these enterprise fail, uh, face as well. So yeah, this is just like a broad landscape of some of the real risks that I see that are already there or like, you know, very much, you know, happening in the near future. No, that, that's really helpful, especially to give us a sense of how many different kinds of things we might be talking about when we're talking about risk in this area. Um, Elham, I'd like to, to come to you. Um, earlier this year, NIST launched its AI risk management framework, and it's following up on that with um, a specific public working group focused on generative AI. Could you tell us about how NIST is approaching risk management in the AI space um, and what you're thinking about in particular around generative AI? Is it, how similar or different is it to the, the broader AI risk management work? We're happy to, uh, Emma Ash, uh, uh, thank you so very much for including me in this important conversation. Um, uh, as you said, NIST, um, uh, back in January, directed by a congressional mandate, released uh, AI risk management framework. It's a voluntary framework for managing the risk of AI systems in a structured, flexible, and uh, measurable way. Uh, AI uh, RMF tries to, the first part of that, tries to provide a interoperable lexicon uh, uh, for terms and uh, uh, vocabulary on what we mean by AI system, what we mean by risk, what are the uh, socio-technical characteristics of a, a trustworthy AI system? Um, basically, setting up the uh, knowledge uh, and information needed to understand what to measure uh, so that we can uh, get to the development of metrics and methodologies for measurement. And then based on those, come up with uh, uh, responses and treatments to the risks identified. So uh, 72 guidelines uh, categorized at a high level into the four functions of map, measure, manage, and govern, uh, provides guidelines uh, through the map functions to identify risks, uh, uh, understand the context, understands uh, 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 the use case, understand the risks uh, uh, in that particular use case, the trade-offs and uh, uh, interactions among the risks, uh, uh, those informations are being used with the measure functions for quantitative or qualitative measurement of the risk identifying and the manage functions comes up with uh, uh, guidelines on how to uh, manage those risks uh, uh, in terms of the uh, accepting, transferring, uh, mitigating. Uh, and the govern functions provides the guidelines for the um, kind of the embedding needed 
for uh, successful, effect effective, and efficient uh, risk management. Uh, AI or MF by design is uh, use case agnostic uh, and uh, technology agnostic. And again, tries to provide that sort of a uh, foundation needed for risk management of AI systems across the domain. Uh, knowing that AI systems are all about context, and I just want to give a, uh, a second everything uh, Nazanin said about the importance of assessing the societal robustness of AI systems beyond just looking at the technical robustness and uh, if they work, if they function, if they're doing what they're supposed to do, but also understand their uh, uh, their risk and impact and being able to measure those risk and impact, which we all know at this moment is a very, um, uh, is a technical challenge. We don't have the right uh, uh, technical or scientific solutions to do that. Uh, so with that, uh, with that lens towards a, a socio-technical approach to risk management, AI or MF provides that uh, uh, horizontal uh, uh, foundations for risk management, but also envision development of the profiles or verticals where uh, the guidelines of AI or MF are tailored slanted to particular use cases. It also envisioned development of the profile cross sectoral profile for general purpose AI, and it also mentioned you know examples for the large language model. So we are uh, developing and um, a kind of delivering on that work. We uh, to address the uh, risk. Uh, uh, of the generative AI and develop the um, kind of guidelines and uh, industry norms uh, for addressing some of the uh, risk of generating uh, uh, generative AI. We launched the public working group in June. It started working in July. It's focusing on uh, right now developing four sets of guidelines. So we could have wait for a year to come up with a full cross sectoral profile um, because of the urgency and the importance of the topic. We decided to divide the work and, and try to uh, work with the community on development of this, of this guidance uh, at a uh, a quicker pace. Uh, and more than 2,000 uh, volunteers are helping us developing those guidelines. Uh, they are working on four sets of guidelines, uh, verification and validation for pre-deployment, pre-release. So all of these uh, 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 entities that are releasing the models are doing some testing internally and model cards are being uh, uh, released saying what type of testing has been done. Uh, and um, it would be good to have some sort of a uh, norm or uh, standard way uh, pr or practice uh, for doing this type of testing and reporting of this testing. So, you know, red teaming is being used, but red teaming may or may not be the only way for doing this type of verification validation. So that's one of the working group. Um, the topic of the uh, authenticity and um, uh, digital content provenance is a uh, important topic and uh, I'm sure everybody relates to the importance of that. Uh, so watermarking has been uh, talked and uh, there's a lot of discussions around that in both research and um, broader um, community. Uh, so a sub-working group is looking at developing guidelines for uh, digital content provenance. Uh, learning from uh, other disciplines, importance of having a uh, you know catalog of the uh, vulnerabilities, uh, failures. Uh, a, a, the third uh, sub-working group is working on incident disclosure, knowing that the things that can go wrong can can happen, uh, help us to better prepare uh, for um, uh, mitigations and management of those type of risks. And because of the importance of the govern function in AI or MF, we often say that everything starts with the govern and ends with the govern. Uh, there is also a subgroup working on a profile of the govern function for generative AI. And govern is is really important because it, it talks about, again, the roles and responsibilities about the uh, policy and procedures that are needed, uh, the, the line of the accountability, and basically uh, promoting a culture of risk understanding and risk uh, measurement and risk management in an entity. And I just want to emphasize that, uh, uh, again, the emphasis is to think about all of this risk at the time of the design. Uh, uh, and de development and deployment, rather than trying to make the risk management as a bolt-on uh, 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 after the systems is in the use and try to figure out what we can do to uh, build the models and systems that are trustworthy by design. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I'll definitely want to, to come back to that point and, and hear from everyone sort of on 
what the feasibility of doing that kind of risk management is in the sort of design and, and pre-release stage, including the questions of transparency and how, do, how much do we understand about what the models are actually doing. Um, but before that, uh, I want to bring in our, our other speakers. First, um, Dave. So you were at OpenAI through some of the pivotal discussions there about how to think about the risks inherent in making tools like DALI and ChatGPT um, and making those tools available to users. You know, those are probably some of the tools that first come to mind for most people when they think, what is generative AI? Um, you also come from a background um, deep in the trust and safety and content moderation world. You were one of the founders of the field. Um, so how did you think about approaching risk management for these kind of user-facing tools at OpenAI? Yeah, the, the question you're asking is really ultimately a product risk question. Um, and in that sense, it's not AI doesn't make it totally new or totally novel. Obviously, AI introduces new kinds of risks, new kinds of things we need to anticipate, but the broader framework that I used in thinking through the risks of those products is not some wholesale departure from how we've thought about product risk uh, generally through my career or how anybody else who does this for a living would think about it. And just to sort of sketch out how that, that works, um, you can think through product risk as a function of basically how likely a given bad behavior is um, to happen in your product. And there's a, there's like sort of a few subsets of that. So one, and actually the dominant one, even beyond the sort of AI factors, is how popular a given kind of misbehavior is, right? All else equal, right now, at least for, for us, we're talking about systems we're setting up where people are going to use those products. They're not behaving autonomously. And so any of the sort of initiative to do problematic things that we're seeing in the system are coming from human users. And we, we actually, at this point in the history of the internet, know quite a lot about the kinds of problematic things that people find appealing to try to do when you get large numbers of them. And so there's there's some there's sort of an expected curve of the kinds of misbehavior that you're going to see people try to engage in. And you can sort of skate to where that is as a first approximation of what to expect. Um, the second, it was the question of how helpful the model actually is for a given kind of problem you're anticipating. Um, so there are certain things where if the model is simply not very capable in a given domain, that's that's sort of self-limiting on some level. And that's where practices like red teaming are super important for establishing where is the model capable in risky domains and where is it, it frankly not very capable such that even if somebody tries to misuse it, they're not going to get hugely helpful results. And then third is not really about AI or people at all. It's about the specific product we were building, right? So as a really concrete example, uh, when we we launched Dolly, when we launched ChatGPT, those are single; those were single player experiences. Um, an individual person was interacting with the model. There weren't there weren't sort of cross personal social interactions. That changes the kinds of problems you can have because you can't be directly harassing a person inside the product itself. That's not to say you don't need to think about it, but it sort of changes your risk surface. Um, and then second, I'd say the second big thing beyond how likely is this bad thing to happen uh, is the question of how good we are at mitigating a given problem. And that's a function of A, how good we are at teaching the model not to be helpful, um, what the sort of techniques we have for our, whether it's RLHF, uh, constitutional AI, various other techniques we have for trying to get the model to not do the bad things, whatever we've decided that means. Um, and then there's this sort of second question of our downstream mitigations. And I think everyone ideally would want the models themselves to be sort of fully proof against misuse. We're not in that world yet. I don't know if we should ever act as if we are in that world, even if we are highly confident we are there from a sort of defense and depth point of view. So yes, you want to invest in core mitigations in the models themselves, but you also need to invest in essentially as many other layers of mitigation and detection as you can think of, hopefully, which are not correlated uh, from a defense and depth point of view, so that even if there's imperfections at any one of those layers, you're probably still okay in, in the big picture. Um, so that was, I would say, a little generic, but broadly how we thought about tackling it. No, that's great. That's it's really helpful. And at a certain, just heads up for everyone, at a certain point, I am going to be asking you for specific examples, um, you know, ways that you can kind of walk through for us what has worked in uh, risk management or trying to identify and um, use different of these tools that folks have been referencing uh, to to address risks. Um, and just to give folks a, a, the audience a little bit more of a sense of how do all of these different frameworks and concepts and ideas really come into play. 
Um, but first I wanna make sure to bring Nicholas into the conversation. Um, so Nicholas, at Google DeepMind, you've had to confront exactly this question of developing best practices in a field that's really nascent. Um, we are, feels like just at the beginning, although I know people have been working on generative AI technologies for decades, um, but for most of the public, these feels like absolutely brand new uh, things that we are, are looking at and thinking about. Um, so how have you approached thinking about what best practices could look like, for example, in developing the um, voluntary commitments that the, uh, the White House and I think seven different companies signed up to earlier this summer, um, or creating the kind of the concept and the work plan for the Frontier Model Forum? Yeah, so there, there are roughly three components that I'd like to highlight. I think that the perhaps most important one is to, to recognize from the outset that there is a lot of research needed here. We're a research-centric organization, so the way we begin is to try to figure out, okay, how, how can we understand the full socio-technological um, uh, set of risks that a particular technology brings around? And so we would have done that, for example, by re re relying on our uh, ethics researchers and other researchers researchers who are looking deeply into this technology and trying to really understand from the outset as a research problem, what is it that we should be looking out for? An example of that is the paper we published um, uh, a couple of years ago on the kinds, together with a lot of other collaborators, on the kinds of harms that you could expect from large language models. And once you start to build those kinds of frameworks and you dig into the research, you get the first conceptual framework within which you can start to, to think about best practices. If you, if you don't have have that in an incredibly nascent field, as you say, you're, you're going to sort of be navigating either by bad analogy and looking at something else and say, oh, it's mostly like this, or you're going to be navigating blind. Neither is a, a very good alternative. <laughs> and so, so the, the other thing is to try to figure out, okay, these are the set of risks that we have. How can we then figure out the mitigations and the best practices. And a large part of that, a huge part of that is realizing that you do not have all the answers yourself. You cannot as an organization just go ahead and say, oh, this is how we're going to solve it. We know best. We're going to make sure that the risks are handled in this particular way. You do need collaboration. And that collaboration has several different dimensions. One is intra-industrial, which is essentially the kind of work that we're doing with the Frontier Model Forum, saying, look, we know that we have a series of best practices that we think work, what do you do and how can we make sure to exchange them? Not just between the founding members of the Frontier Model Forum, but also with small, medium-sized enterprises who are deploying these, using these in different ways, integrating them in their work. So we can build a knowledge base and, and address what I think is one of the core challenges here, which is um, somewhat of a knowledge asymmetry between the companies that are developing and building the technology and the people who are deploying and using it. And so that's the second part. You need external validation, but not only uh, across the industrial dimension. You also need to talk to civil society to understand, okay, what are some of the risks that we're missing here? And how can we make sure that we get this done? You need to take the latest academic research and you need to integrate that as much as possible. And that, that actually means that you also need to figure out a good way to provide uh, access to these models for academia, civil society and others, so that you can get some kind of uh, qualified input. So, so you're not just sitting in your room and guessing what these models can do, but you're actually evaluating them live. So I think that's another really important component that we're, that we're looking at. And then lastly, also best practices at some point need to be anchored in, in sort of democratic institutions, which means you need to have this government dimension where sometimes governments should if that is what they choose to do, to legislate. But other cases, they will ask industry to come up with codes of conduct or best practices that can be used to understand the field before it's legislated. And that kind of dialogue also needs to be going on. Lastly, I think one really important piece here is to, to sort of realize that not only is this an incredibly nascent field, it is also developing at a very high pace which means that you actually need to build in foresight and different kinds of, of edge uh, frontier, if you want, research into what you're doing. Figure out what is the next generation of technology going to look like? Because we can't, we can't start mitigating that when we have it or when we're at it. You need to start to think 
alongside the evolution in order to have the right mitigations in place. This goes to the point that Al Hamot's making, that you want to have a trustworthy by design. Well, if you do, you need to understand the capabilities that are coming down the pike in order to also figure out what the risks are. And I think that's that's something that's uh, tremendously hard to do, but also really important. And, and, and there was something that Dave mentioned that is sort of a case in point, which is that currently these models are prompted. There's sort of a, somebody, a user sitting in front of a model and using it. And we're thinking about this at almost as a dialogical situation with a user and a model. But that is not going to be true for very much longer. Very soon, you're going to have different models interacting with each other, presenting an entirely new set of risks. And then you're going to have autonomous agents. And those autonomous agents are going to represent an entirely new class of challenges. We need to get ahead of that and think about what the contours of best practice could look like, even for those kinds of technological uh, steps that, that may well be coming next. So and that is that is, we have people actively doing foresight research, thinking about how do we address new issues that can come from artificial agency or that could can be uh, predicted from the massive interconnection of the enormous multiplicity of models. So those are the core three things that I would, would say are important. It's like the base research, the broad external validation and the foresight, and you need to combine them. And I, it, it doesn't hurt to have a good dose of humility as well, because nobody has the right answers to these problems. And so, so constantly be on the lookout and sort of searching for new solutions and not becoming too convinced of your own solutions is, a, is another helpful thing to do. If I can just add my uh, plus one to what Nicholas said that there is, that we all aware and it's, it's important to mention that there is no quick fix to address this challenge and, and uh, the importance of taking a deliberate community driven, uh, deeply engaged all, all sector of the community uh, that builds off of uh, uh, research and development, right? We don't have the right scientific underpinning for all of them. Uh, and also be able to evolve and address the, uh, these challenges and keep up with the pace of the technology as, they, as these uh, companies are keeping us on our toes with, uh, with a very quick uh, pace of the change. Yeah, thank you. Well, that really um, tees up a question that I think many of you have addressed this idea that whatever these best practices end up being, as they're developed, they need to be developed in a more broad, open, more participatory um, kind of process that really brings in a lot of different perspectives. And um, that's certainly the, the way that CDT likes to think about and approach standards development. Um, my colleague, Mallory Nodal, uh, has been doing a lot of work with colleagues over the years of trying to get more civil society and human rights advocates into internet technical standards bodies like IETF. Um, and, and we know that it can be a really big uphill battle. Um, so I'm curious for folks thoughts on what are concrete ways we can actually try to make these processes more open, bring in more perspectives? Where are there places, what be it existing standards bodies or other venues, either new or to be created, where these kinds of discussions are or should be happening? What kinds of things can we do to actually broaden that group of people who are really at the heart of these conversations. If I can jump in very quickly again, um, uh, join our generative AI public working group. So uh, one of the things that we did with the uh, development of the AI RMF and we learned early on, uh, well, uh, you know, NIST has a, uh, working with the community, stakeholder engagement is part of our DNA. Everything that we do is the work with the community. But one, one thing we learned in AI RMF is, the importance of uh, very inclusive engagements. So we definitely want to hear from uh, you know the usual uh, uh, backgrounds of uh, technology developers, computer scientists, engineers, mathematicians, statisticians, but also the community that study the impact of the uh, technology on the community. Going back to uh, uh, foresightedness that Nicholas brought up. Um, uh, so we engaged uh, philosophers, uh, psychologists, uh, uh, sociologists, and it's important to keep doing that and and. Uh, um, convening the community around this problem is something that NIST has been very successful in doing this. So we love to hear uh, and, and get participations in generative AI uh, working group, uh, but also uh, giving a shout out to all the different other efforts that's going on and make sure that we are all connected and we are all working together. So bringing our energies together to be more effective and efficient. 
And I would I would echo that. I think NIST is doing brilliant work on this. I think internationally, uh, the OECD has actually opened up a series of expert working groups that are also open to all. And, and, and the OECD is an interesting site of sort of the, nego the negotiation of standards and, and new um, and new best practices because it, because it has a, a broad uh, international collaboration. Now it doesn't cover global south, so there's still a lot to do. But I think they have a an ambition to try to figure out how we can bring together many different international perspectives here too. Because we're increasingly aware that the way these risks are perceived is also, of course, between you know through a cultural tint, and they will be different in different places, which is which is something I'm sure. I mean, Dave will have seen plenty of in his in his world and content moderation. Too. And so figuring out sort of where those sites of negotiation are is one of the key things that, that we need to do. I, I find the OECD is very promising. They're doing a lot of good work in their expert groups. I think the work NIST is doing is brilliant. I think there probably is a need for more forums like this um, and uh, would welcome uh, other ideas on this as well. Less a direct forum idea and more uh, sort of a, a, a broader framework point. I do also think there's utility to bringing the sort of tools and techniques that we use to do mitigation at a practical level into the public significantly more. A lot of the sort of best approaches to dealing with content at scale are locked up behind various sort of corporate borders simply because of where those, those pieces of knowledge have been developed. Um, and this seems like an opportunity to move that more into the public square, which is important for informing those, those sort of discourses around what we want to do from a risk management point of view, because what we want to do is sort of to some extent subsidiary to what we know how to do, what we can figure out how to do from a mitigation point of view. And the conversation is, in my experience, often better uh, the more richly people understand the sort of available intervention options. Um, so I think that is an opportunity at this juncture, both for AI, but actually, I hope, for content sort of on the internet more broadly. If I can add my two cents, uh, I completely agree with everyone else on the panel, uh, but specifically, like since I've been working on AI safety and alignment over the last like 11 months, I guess, since chat GBD, um, there are two things I feel like the open source and the open access community can, you know, progress in. The first one is uh, evaluation and red teaming. So essentially, there's a big gap, uh, you know, clearly, like, you know, the model, like the closed models are way ahead of these open access models in terms of capabilities. Uh, that is like, you know, bridging um, at a faster pace. But then there's also like this, you know, benchmarking gap on red teaming and like, how do we know if like these open models have the same capabilities or no? So the DEF CON red teaming, I think is a good example of like, you know, getting a lot of like hackers and people together to evaluate these models, but also like, you know, it gives like two things, which is trust, like, you know, are we, you know, can, can these, uh, can people start trusting these models? How good are they? How bad are they? What are the risks associated with them? It also helps in educating people about, you know, these large language models. I feel those events are really good. Um, there's no open source uh, benchmark or data set for red teaming uh, as of now. Uh, there's just like a small data set that Entropic put out um, almost like last year, end of last year. So apart from that, there's nothing out there. Um, the second specific ask is on the infra side. These models are like very infra heavy. And again, like uh, most of the computers behind these like big closed companies. Um, and so like, you know, working at Hugging Face, that was like one of the things and like, you know, even Hugging Face still is like much bigger, but like academic labs and, you know, so this is where like the government can step in and help. And we have seen that like with the UK government, um, the French government, a lot of these governments are stepping in to provide the compute and infra to just study these research as research artifacts. Um, so that I think can be like done more because um, as these models are scaling up, uh, there'll be a lot more demand for infra. On the other hand, the good news is that uh, the open source models, uh, there's a lot more tooling available. So they have been doing a good job at just finding ways to do efficient fine tunings because, you know, because of lack of infra. So there's been so much research and progress made on PEFT, which is parameter efficient fine tuning, LoRa and QLoRa, which is just quantization. And so um, I think there's like pros and cons of each of these, but I just wanted to like highlight that these could be something that we could also be focusing on. Yeah, and, it, and it's a really good point too to highlight how 
different factors or features of the technical environment then shape what is focused on for develop, right? Do you, if you don't have enough computing power or infrastructure to do really high compute intensive processes, then the focus is gonna be, how do you make that faster, cheaper, easier to do? And maybe that's a really important set of questions to answer, but maybe you could address the infrastructure problem and then put your energy and attention to addressing some other problem. So it's, yeah, it's really interesting to hear from all of you, we've identified so many different sources of risks, so many different potential directions for intervention. Um, but I also wanted to come back to a point that um, Nasmeen, you raised directly about open source uh, questions and I think has been sort of hinted at um, in a lot of folks' responses. Um, so there's a big debate happening right now about sort of the role of open sourcing in generative AI. Right. There's um, a lot of benefits to open source software in general, um, but also I think a lot of people are approaching with a sense of nervousness or skepticism. Like how, how do you, I'm having a hard time even keeping track of all the risks that are in front of us with this new technology. And then you let it out there in the world. How would we enforce any kind of particular approach to risk management? Um, so, so talk me down. How if I, if I am coming as a skeptic of, or just maybe a little tentative, um, playing devil's advocate, uh, what what do you see the role of open source, open access models being in this space? Does it have, what kind of role does it play in risk management and how we think about risk in this area? Yes, yeah, so uh, again, it's like there are trade-offs definitely associated with, you know, open versus closed access. Um, essentially, like the, you know, the biggest one is a powerful technology in the hands of a few versus like democratizing the process and, you know, basically just educating people, letting them interact, letting them like, you know, you know, play with it and seeing like, you know, is this something that they should fear versus like, you know, how reliable are these uh, themselves like make that educated guess. Um, and on the other hand, obviously, like, you know, uh, these could be misused and, you know, they could, once you open source, it's out there and can be like cloned and, you know, uh, basically it's out, it's out. Like, you don't, you can't pull a plug, like, you know, open AI says it, right? Uh, if something bad happens. So, so essentially there are like, you know, clear trade-offs there and like, you know, I, I haven't like, it's basically a spectrum and you should think through it, depending on like, you know, which model you plan to release. But, you know, uh, I would say that, you know, I'm the uh, reason I lean more towards open source and open access is because I come from the research community and uh, over there, like, you know, it would be good to like just basically, like, you know, play with it, do red teaming and evaluate benchmark. And, you know, uh, also like it allows you to like develop tools. Like, you know, if you're thinking about risk mitigation, you need to actually know what its capabilities are in the first place so that you can think about how to mitigate them. And to even know these capabilities, you need to like, you know, study these artifacts, like what was the trading data that is never released, even for a lot of open access models, the training data is never revealed. Like for example, like Llama 2, um, and even like the Falcon models, like they do write like, you know, what, what went into it, but there's no clarity on uh, exactly how much data, what was the distribution across these different sources and so on. Red Pajama obviously was like a completely open source data set. Uh, but like, you know, so that's the thing, like, you know, if you had to do proper auditing and risk, uh, uh, risk assessment, you would need what the training data is. You would need to know the architecture uh, of these models. The, uh, the number of parameters, which is kind of like the minimum information you would need. Uh, and so, so there's like a, like a broad list of things that, you know, you, if you had to start thinking about mitigating risk, you would at least need to know these. And that is only possible if the developers are open to like, you know, allowing researchers to come and like evaluate these, like, you know, uh, going to Nicholas point that, you know, you need external validation and evaluation of these, uh, you know, of these uh, powerful models. And I think if I can add to what Nasni is, it's one of those unsatisfying issues where there is no easy answer. Um, if, when we have done this historically, for example, one of the things that we have done is open source something called AlphaFold, which is an engine for folding proteins. And, and that process involved talking to dozens of experts in biosecurity, bioethics, et cetera, trying to figure out, trying to evaluate, getting an external advice on whether or not this was the right thing to do. And the, this, in the end, the judgment was that the upside for biological research and sciences was so much larger than the potential risk that this was the right thing to do. So we ended up providing uh, that as, as uh, that openly, um, but but that will be something you have to do for almost all models and try to think through on a case by case basis: is it right to release this, or am I putting a, a capability out there that can 
actually carry more risk than it carries benefit. And, and one of the things I think is interesting is that we don't necessarily have the right frameworks for making that assessment for generic models. So that's, that's an open research question. How do we, for example, we could all imagine a, in a, like in three or four generations, models are capable of doing a lot of things that you can't do today. And what you would then ask is, at what point is there a threshold where you start leaning away from open sourcing towards more controlled access because you believe that some of the capabilities could potentially be dangerous and i think this is this is uh, this is one where we where we could benefit from more research benefit from more analysis and more frameworks um, and i'm 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 sort of cautiously optimistic that we'll get there because i think more and more people now recognize that that this is not like open sourcing an operating system when we call it open source it's not the same thing i mean linux is one thing providing a model like this is something very different and i, I think that we we sort of sometimes we get caught in legacy language and it would almost be better for us to have new language for this yeah i, I agree with that completely and to give us sort of I think a nice complementary example to the to the sort of alpha fold example. Um, it's not just a question here of the scale or the sort of when we say capability, we often mean sort of slightly sci-fi advanced capabilities. It can also be something as simple as what the model specifically can do today, right? So we are already now in a world where downstream of the open sourcing of increasingly realistic image models we are dealing with a proliferation of the generation of artificial CSAM, which obviously nobody wanted, no researchers in developing these things like thought that was great. But given our current techniques for sort of making models safe or unable to generate certain kinds of images, uh, we don't really have the ability to make that stick once we open source those images or those models today. And so we are just now in a world where we are going to be dealing with cleaning up that problem forever. And that's not to put anybody on the spot, that's like obviously a difficult and complicated question. Um, but when you think through sort of that that issue uh, Nicholas raised around capability, it's not just a question of future capabilities. It's a question of really thinking about the difficulty of misuse as a practical matter today, where something like AlphaFold sounds much scarier, but really you kind of need a biology lab to do anything with that, whereas making a lot of images is much more accessible to a much broader number of people. And so it creates a very different set of practical risks uh, when you take all of that combined. Yes, and is a great reminder too that the risks that we might see coming from generative AI tools or capabilities out there are not happening in a nice, neat, this is just a generative AI kind of question, right? There's a lot of discussion and debate um, and work right now on the issue of CSAM online generally, and what you know, what are the tools and capabilities to detect actual CSAM? Not only, uh, and, and now you have potentially a profusion of generative AI produced CSAM coming in um, alongside that. That's not only going to be a generative AI question. That's going to affect the law and policy debates around how do we handle the issue as a whole. Um, so I think in our our panel yesterday on um, how generative AI may affect uh, concerns around elections and election integrity and disinformation. There was a lot of sense of, there was a risk of it supercharging a lot of challenges or problems that we've already seen because now the ability to make um, content that really looks like it was produced by a human or you know accomplishes a certain goal uh, is ever more readily available to a much broader set of people. Yeah, um, we are getting some audience questions in, which is great, uh, and folks are, are welcome to um, send us some others. There are a couple um, that have uh, are hitting on some of the same themes of people really wanting to drill down on what are ways that um, civil society could not only get involved in discussing, discussing regulation or legislation around generative AI or um, even red teaming and evaluation being sort of reactive to models that already exist, what are the options or, or avenues for getting more involved in the very design of generative AI applications? I don't know if anyone has, has any thoughts or ideas about that. I feel like it might sort of feed into this conversation we've been having about open sourcing, but um, Elhan, yeah, I, I saw you. Yeah. No, Nicholas, please go ahead. Is it very quickly? I think I mean I, this is one where where um, we 
we struggle doing this at scale, but what we have done is convene a number of different roundtables in different places where we have tried to make sure that we have, for example, teachers around the table and civil society organizations interested in education, or we have discussed things like, you know, labor. And I, I, to some degree, um, the question is how you scale this kind of engagement, because to, to a large degree, you, you want... Uh, this input to be substantial and deep and material, uh, but at the same time you want to reach as many people as possible. The roundtable is a nice format because you get really substantive feedback and, and you get a chance to dig in on the issues, which I think is really helpful. And we've done that in a number of different cases as a method or a mechanism for soliciting that kind of feedback or we're really building a view around how, how to best design. Um, and then I think model access is going to be another kind of mechanism that will be built out over time and will be really interesting Interesting, but that again will also not scale to, 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 to large to, to very large groups uh, for different reasons. Um, and for infra, as was mentioned, but Nasni. So, so I think I mean there's there's a there's a need here for for a new kind of set of mechanisms too to sort through this. And that's why I think it it might be interesting to figure out where can you aggregate as much as possible of these different concerns, and how can you make sure that you articulate those concerns as clearly as possible so that they can be shared. I'm I'm hoping that we will be able to find interlocutors for, for example, the Frontier Model Forum that will help us do that. Um, but would you know welcome uh, others' views as well. Nicola said everything I want to say in, in a much better, more eloquent way. Uh, I was I was going to say the same thing that you know this Richardson doing more and again as 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 we work we learn that uh, roundtables and selling stations all of them are great uh, and and the point about scalability and the difficulty with that I, I just want to say this thing that the fact that we are thinking about this and the fact that we know that we have the uh, the uh, voices that we had and on the table previously for example in in many of these technology discussions. Uh, we're not enough, we're not inclusive, and we have to hear from broader uh, part of the community is a, is a really good thing, right? You know, you know the problem, and then as Nicola said, we're trying to to uh, to figure out how to solve them. Same thing for the standard community. Right now, it's mostly um, uh, uh, practitioners and technical practitioners. Uh, how do we make uh, you know open up that type of conversation? So these other uh, uh, thought and, and input and uh, uh, part of the community are uh, around the table and their voices are part of the conversations from the get-go. So again, I just try to be uh, to be more optimistic. And while we have a lot of challenges in front of ourselves, knowing that we are uh, knowing that we have to work on this is a really good thing. I I'd add um, I think what everybody said was right, but also sort of touching on scalability the way we've discussed it here sort of frames it around a relatively small number of industrial actors trying to scale their consultation with civil society. That is good and right. There's also, I think, particularly touching back on the open source point, as we see more and more developers fine tuning their own models, there's going to be a question of the scalability of these sorts of consultations across a long tail of developers. And that I think is an probably even less well understood problem. Um, the question of consultation with civil society by a small number of powerful tech companies is certainly not solved, but not a totally new one in this context, whereas really small developers typically don't do anything like that, aren't equipped to do it. And so I, it's another case of needing, I think, novel techniques, maybe even some sort of AI assisted techniques in terms of gathering feedback to try to figure out easier, lower friction ways for people to have input. That's a great point. And I also think that the, the ability for civil society to articulate needs, thoughts, and questions to government, uh, to Elham's point, is, is another dimension of this that needs to be thought through as well. Because obviously, it shouldn't just be tech companies or developers. This isn't just a technology it's embedded in all of our social systems. It should be about the overall democratic governance of society in the long run and how we think about that. And I think that this is this is sort of something where, where government is also, I think, struggling to find the right forms of aggregating this kind of feedback well. 
So if I can add, I think one very concrete step that they can take is data curation. So um, they, you know, we had to make this a decision on what kind of task force we choose for reinforcement learning with human feedback, because essentially at the end of the day, what alignment and AI safety does is that it encodes these human values. So whose values are we encoding and where does this data come from is a key crucial question. Um, and so we had access to very limited task force to, you know, go for, uh, you know, and decide which demographics and what are the sort of values that we are choosing for aligning and fine tuning our models. But if we had access to a much larger task, task force across a more diverse demographic, I think that would be really great. Um, and I'm hoping that in the future that would be more much more accessible. Yeah, no, that I I really um, I really appreciate all of those points and and thank you for as you can tell from the different questions we're getting from the audience, I think people want to be involved. They want they don't want to miss the boat on you know this amazing new technology that seems to be um, sweeping everything, uh, but also to really get some concrete ideas of what that could look like and how many different parts of the process um, or ways of getting involved there there might end up being. I think we have time for um, one last question. Uh, and uh, we've got a question here about essentially that we, so we've had a lot of great discussion and ideas about the kinds of things that should be happening or could be happening um, that we all want to see happening, but how can businesses, especially those in competitive markets be incentivized to allocate resources towards the research and the different practices um, and civil society engagement and all of that, um, that really emphasizes ethical deployment and long-term safety implications of AI. Um, how the, at, at the end of the day, a lot of this decision-making and a lot of the, the development of things is happening by big industry players. Um, and so how do, you, how do we get people to do that at those companies without, um, while they're also concerned about maybe compromising their immediate profit, profitability or market position? I mean, this is perhaps a, a uh, makes me a, a a bad capitalist, but uh, th th this is why we have laws, um, in in my view, right? Like part of the beauty of regulation, if we can figure out how to pass reasonable regulation, is it sets a minimum that everybody needs to skate towards and takes the pressure off individual participants from a downward sort of competition point of view. Maybe simplistic, maybe too naive, but. Oh, I like that. I think I think the answer is obviously to one component, it's laws, but there's also there's also something to be said for, for radical self-interest. This is a technology that's very transformative. And unless you actually spend time on thinking through what safety and security for the technology looks like, the trust that people will have for this technology will be very low. And so even if you sort of start with the assumption that everyone is interested in profitability, which, which is one assumption you can start with, profitability needs to be profitability over a longer time. And for technology not to be banned or shunned or in other ways be resisted by society, you actually need to, as a company, to think through the safety and ethics of what you do. And that's not even assuming that there are a lot of good people working on this because they believe it's the right thing to do, which actually also is the case. <laughs> I would submit that but I would also understand the skepticism that a lot of people feel when they hear that statement. So I think self-interest in the long run actually is a really good incentive. I do believe that legislation is absolutely necessary and I think laws and institutions that can help enforce those laws because laws on their own do very little. It's the institutions you build around laws that, that sort of create the incentives is key. And if I can just add to what Nicholas and, and Dave said, uh, we also need to have the right scientific underpinning for, for helping those laws to be enforceable. So uh, we just talked about the difficulty in, and challenge of evaluation. So if the laws are asking for safety of AI, for example, they study at this abstract level, they don't give um, description of what it means and how to test for that and how to assure safety. So. Uh, just again, uh, another shout out for uh, advancing research and uh, scientific work in this area. Um, I, we're almost out of time, but I can't <laughs> I can't stop myself from one more question for you all. Um, I think that that was a really great set of responses to that question of you know how do we create these incentives, but it also has me thinking about the inherently international dimension of all of this, right? And you could maybe imagine the laws that the United States might create 
or that the European Union is actively in the process of debating um, any number of countries around the world who may, for example, want to sign up to or endorse, endorse a code of conduct on generative AI um, that we were hearing uh, Assistant Secretary of Commerce Alan Davidson talk a little bit about um, yesterday. There's I think a, a set of actors who may be very much in agreement of where they want to see in general safe and responsible AI developing, but maybe not every country agrees to that. How, how do you think about the that sort of global international dimension? Do you think there is a world in which we could get general broad agreement on what best practice in responsible AI looks like? Do you think we're going to end up in a world where we have a couple of different answers to those questions? Um, how, how do you see this playing out maybe over the next um, 10 or 15 years? I think you will have different answers. And I think you're seeing that not just across legislation, but actually across government investment in technology. It's quite interesting to follow the launch of, for example, Falcon in the United Arab Emirates. So the investments in sovereign uh, large language models in Japan and other places that signal very clearly that governments feel that their culture or their language or their values cannot be adequately represented in models created outside of their sovereign influence, which means that you will see see different answers technologically through government investments in technology. You will see different answers legislatively. And that's what we've seen across content moderation as well. There is the, the long arc of free speech doesn't bend towards the First Amendment. It is actually much more complicated than that. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think there may there may be as hope of some like very de minimis, extreme physical safety risk oriented consensus, at least for commercial actors. Although again, if you start to think about these things as sites of government power, that's going to mitigate in the opposite direction, at least for models being used by states themselves. Um, but on the, on the question of sort of speech governance and what kind of content production norms uh, we're going to have, there's we don't agree as a global society about what kind of speech is okay. And we're not going to solve that sort of through any set of processes around AI specifically because it's a deeper values disagreement. Spoken like a veteran of the content moderation discussions. <laughs> Um, well, I think that is, unfortunately, all the time that we have today. Thank you all so much for this really fascinating discussion. Um, I certainly learned a lot. I learned about many different kinds of risks that we're accounting for, the role of kind of evaluation of, um, of models and the need to continue to develop ways to evaluate them, including benchmarks and other processes. Um, so I think the, the best practices conversation is still at very early days as far as I can tell, um, but it is really great to hear such a strong agreement across all of you about the importance of having that be an open um, and participatory sort of process. Uh, and I, I leave this panel feeling somewhat optimistic about all of this, which is a nice place to be. Um, so thank you all very, very much. Um, and now we are all, we are excited to share with you a set of talks from people across a variety of fields who are already exploring how they can incorporate generative AI tools and systems into their work um, and what the opportunities and risks of doing so are. So over the next 30 minutes, you will hear from Sarah Beth Berman at the American Journalism Project, Kelly Zaney at the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center, Steve Lee from the Skill Up Coalition, Dana Ingleton from Human Rights Information and Documentation Systems, or Hiradox, and Sal Khan, the founder of the Khan Academy. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Beth Berman. I'm the CEO of a venture philanthropy called the American Journalism Project, which is dedicated to rebuilding local news. In this session, I'm going to share how we at the American Journalism Project are helping local news organizations across the country explore the applications of generative AI in their work. First, just to set the stage a bit, I'll tell you a little bit about the American Journalism Project and what we do. We're a venture philanthropy focused on catalyzing the growth of the nonprofit local news sector. This means we rally philanthropic dollars 
And then we use those dollars to build and grow nonprofit news organizations with a laser focus on building sustainable news organizations that can endure. Over the last two decades, largely brought on by the rise of the internet, local newspapers have been in really a slow motion decline. Newspaper advertising revenue has dropped by 82%. 2,500 newspapers have outright shuttered, and on average, we are losing two American newspapers a week. Since 2000, there has been a 57% decline in the number of American journalists and editors serving in communities. What this means is that many of the remaining publications that still exist are what we call ghost newspapers. They're offering mostly national news with very little original reporting about what's happening in their local communities. In fact, there was one study that came out last year that showed that only 17% of the stories in local newspapers are actually local. And the implications of this are well documented and they're dire. This is not abstract. Political scientists have now measured the degree to which the hollowing out of daily newspapers in America have had profound consequences on our democracy. It's leading to the decline in civic engagements. Americans have become less knowledgeable about their local governments. They're less interested in the actions their local officials are taking, and they're less likely to participate on election day. Timothy Snyder, Many of you may be familiar with his work. He's a Yale historian and the author of On Tyranny, calls the local news crisis the essential problem of our republic. We see our role at the American Journalism Project as ushering in a new model for how we finance local news in our country as nonprofit organizations that we sustain in similar ways that we do other civic institutions that help stitch our communities together. We make growth investments in existing organizations and we incubate new news organizations. To date, we've committed over $42 million to 41 grantee newsrooms from Mississippi to Montana, from Puerto Rico to West Virginia. And that number is growing. In addition to these direct investments, we've helped mobilize close to $60 million in local philanthropy to launch market specific initiatives as part of a program we've developed with civic leaders, place-based funders, and news organizations to understand the information gaps in a community and to figure out the right solutions to fill those gaps. As many people will touch on throughout this conference, the rise of generative AI is giving way to a moment of profound change in how society engages with news and information. AI will have significant implications on our society, and the journalism industry is no exception. And so with this in mind, in July, the American Journalism Project announced a new partnership with OpenAI to help local news organizations explore and understand the use of AI in their newsrooms. The opportunities that AI presents are promising. It could allow journalism organizations to engage in deeper and richer analysis of data and information, strengthen the user and reader experience, and equip journalists and readers with powerful tools to process information and data. At the same time, there are many important concerns that AI developers and journalists and society need to contend with, including the spread of misinformation, increased distrust, concerns over bias and privacy issues and copyright. We think it's really critical that local news organizations are engaging with these tools and thinking smartly about how to deploy them and when not to deploy them. By the same token, generative AI and its algorithms are really only as strong as the news and information they are drawing from. Robust reporting and people-led fact-finding efforts at the local level are among the most important for sourcing reliable information. AI's success and its reliability is necessarily dependent on a strong local news infrastructure. With that in mind, we're doing two things as it relates to AI. 
First, we're creating a product studio to explore the application of AI in local news organizations. We'll give local news organizations we work with coaching and help them explore how to leverage AI tools for their work. And we'll make sure that all the local news organizations we work with have access to the learnings that come out of this work by documenting and sharing best practices, lessons that surface from the experiments as they unfold. Second, we're going to be making grants to organizations in our portfolio so newsrooms can test AI application. And from that, we hope to share examples of what it looks like, what the work looks like, what's working, and make sure that the journalism field at large is aware of the smart applications of these tools. In addition, OpenAI has offered us free access to API credits, up to $5 million of them. And that is something that our news organizations will have access to should they choose to use it. We are really at the beginning of this work. A lot of ideas are beginning to surface. Things like creating personalized communications to reach new donors, members, and corporate sponsors. Using AI to help code to improve websites and products. Leveraging AI to brainstorm headlines or to brainstorm social media copy. Analyzing data, both for reporting and to understand audience data. Automating coverage of public meetings. Assisting with copy editing, helping to scale community engagement and one-on-one -on -one direct interaction with community members. These are the kinds of ideas that are surfacing. And over the coming months, we will learn a lot about how to best use to how to best use these tools. So thank you so much for having me. We are going to learn a lot over the coming months and we will look forward to sharing that as we do. Hi everyone, it is so great to be with you to talk about this really remarkable uh, voice recognition AI technology that Illinois Holocaust Museum has rolled out uh, in the past eight years. Uh, we began to really think about as we move further away from the history of the Holocaust, and face a collapsing window of time where we were losing our survivors, we knew that we had to think about ways to continue to preserve and share their stories for generations to come. And so we partnered with USC Shoah Foundation, who had developed a new technology called Dimensions and Testimony, where they were using custom voice recognition technology to record survivor testimonies, but to be able to ask them questions so that you could in real time uh, through this uh, voice technology, have a conversation and ask survivors questions. Uh, so we sent seven of our survivors to participate uh, in recording their testimonies and being asked questions. Uh, and ultimately in the end, what we were given were uh, seven survivors who could answer upwards to 20 to 25,000 questions about their experiences during, uh, before, and even after the Holocaust as well as just questions about their life uh, in general. Uh, everything from um, what their favorite sport might be to their favorite color, their favorite food, to perhaps more serious topics about whether or not um, the Holocaust made them question their faith or uh, what uh, lessons do they have for us today? What do they think about uh, ongoing hate and genocide in the world? Uh, and I have to say eight years in uh, to this project, uh, I'm still amazed uh, when I observe visitors asking questions of these survivors, and I think to myself, oh, I don't know if they're going to have an answer uh, to that, and and they do, uh, because these aren't answers that are being pulled, you know, randomly down from the internet. Um, these are actually answers uh, that uh, are being pulled essentially from the cloud that the survivors uh, answered, so it's pretty remarkable. Um, we now have an experience at the museum called the Survivor Stories Theater, where our visitors uh, come into a 60-plus person theater, uh, watch an eight to nine minute video that gives an introduction or context to the survivor's story. And then through a volunteer facilitator who um, asks the survivors the questions, um, they uh, have an experience. And what we've uh, noticed, and I'm going to show you kind of a little sample of that in a moment, uh, is that our visitors aren't saying to the volunteer, could you ask Aaron or Sam what life was like before the Holocaust? They're looking at Aaron and Aaron or Sam on the screen and saying, Sam, what was it like, you know, growing up uh, in Poland before the war? Aaron, what was it like to be uh, in hiding, right, for two years? 
Uh, so they're talking to uh, the survivor on the screen and what it's created is a really personal and intimate experience where we know that we can never replace uh, a survivor who's sitting uh, in front of you uh, in real life. Uh, but that experience sometimes can be really intimidating, make uh, people nervous, uh, and we're not seeing that with the, with their technology. There's a kind of a real comfort in being able to ask the questions that you're most interested uh, in learning about. Uh, and it's also creating a really profound historical empathy uh, in uh, learning more about this human being sitting in front of you, that it's not just about uh, a survivor of the Holocaust, but you're learning also too about their life before and after, uh, that kind of a human experience of the resiliency and strength that it took uh, to rebuild in the aftermath of this genocide. I think what's also too important to point out is that USC Shoah Foundation really believed in this concept of ethical editing. So you're not editing out mannerisms and characteristics of, of survivors. So we have a, a survivor, Aaron, um, who talks a lot with his hand, uh, and that's not edited out. Uh, we have uh, survivors, oftentimes when you ask them questions that will take you know either short or even sometimes long uh, pauses. One of the survivors, Pink is Gooder, when you ask him, do you have any regrets? There's a full minute pause while he is kind of emotionally gathering himself in order to answer that, that question that's really difficult for him. Those aren't edited out as you wouldn't do uh, if a real survivor was sitting in front of you and tell them that they, you know, kind of need to move on or, or speed it up. Uh, so that that's really important to kind of preserve that experience. But what I want to do now is just show you two brief clips um, from the experience, the point of view of Fritzi and Aaron, um, and you can see uh, how how this interaction plays out. So I'll play the first clip. It's gonna be a little bit of a pause, uh, and we'll end uh, with Aaron what this has done it stirred up a lot of the memories that i didn't want to think about anymore that i thought were hidden before we were taken into the ghetto it was during the last days of passover in the middle of that night there was the knock that came on our door my mother opened the door and there were soldiers standing there with a gun pointing at her. We lived in this ghetto until one day they came to take us to the train stations. I have so much more to tell you. So Please ask me questions. So does anyone have a question for Fritzi? Yes. What was the hardest part of your experience in the concentration camp? I thought I would die when I was walking towards the gas chambers. I thought I would die when I didn't have enough food. I feel humbled by the experience. I feel this is, some, this, this is probably the best thing that I can do for the future for both myself, the museum, and the audience. This is our memory. This is what, uh, what we've gone through and spoken about for to thousands and thousands of young people about our losing our families, living in conditions which are unbearable, especially as a 10-year-old because you wanted to live so desperately. All this comes out in this hologram. And uh, I think it'll serve a great purpose for the future. Because I was always concerned that once we die, the Holocaust will be a paragraph in history. They kill Jews. That's it. This will prevent it. So I hope you found uh, meaning in the words of, of Fritzi and Aaron. I have to tell you, uh, we lost Fritzi about uh, two years ago and Aaron about four. So uh, it's, of course, uh, personally and professionally, uh, you know, wonderful to continue uh, to have their stories to share, but I think it continues to uh, show uh, the strength uh, and importance of 
uh, this great technology uh, that we're able uh, to give to our visitors uh, at the museum. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Lee. I'm the CEO of the Skill Up Coalition. And on behalf of both myself and my colleague, Matt G, who you'll hear from in a moment, uh, we just wanted to thank you. Thank you to the Center for Democracy and Technology for the privilege of allowing us to share a few thoughts on Gen AI and what it has meant for our respective organizations. Um, so Skill Up is a technology platform. Uh, we help connect vulnerable adults and young adults to high quality jobs and education providers. And, uh, and what I think is important to understand is how Skill Up users, of which we've had several million come to our site uh, since we launched a few years ago, how they come to our platform. What's their reality? Um, so I think there are three realities. One, they come with lots of self-doubt. Uh, they've been burned by the past to experiences that honestly have not been good. Second, they're uncertain of the skills that they're gonna need in order to thrive in the current marketplace. And then third, really importantly, they lack social capital connections. Uh, this notion that sometimes it's who you know, not what you know, that can be most important. And so for skill up, Gen AI, if used correctly, and we'll talk about that in a bit, can really, really be a game changer. It helps to create bespoke experiences that make it all about you, that are tailored to you. And that word you, uh, we think is operative on how we think about Gen AI. So one, it helps job seekers doubt their own self-doubt, right? Because we, using Gen AI, can surface up opportunities that are bespoke to them. We can curate opportunities for careers and jobs and educational opportunities that meet you where you are. We can help you understand what skills you have and maybe more importantly, what you don't have, right? We can offer up skills fillers to help, skill, uh, help fill skill gaps that pertain to you as an individual. And then lastly, we can help through using social capital or coaching to help flip the script. So it really is about what you know and not who you know that matters. And we can help connect job seekers to connection points that'll be helpful to you. That said, there are always two sides to a story. And so as we regale the benefits of what Gen AI can do for us, I think it's crucial, and I think we're all thinking about this, right? That we comprehend the potential and negative consequences that this can, um, uh, that this can bear. And I think it's come upon all of us to heed the warning cry around bias and ethics so that we ensure job seekers aren't led down a slippery slope of unintended consequences. So on this note, and so many other issues around data and ethics, let me introduce you to my friend and data uh, expert, uh, Matt G. Thanks, Steve. I'm Matt Gee, co-founder and chief data nerd at BrightHive. And I'd like to start just by saying that I am so inspired by partners like SkillUp who are finding incredibly creative and impactful ways to use Gen AI for good. Along with SkillUp, we are seeing hundreds of exciting applications of generative AI in education, in workforce training, in economic mobility, and beyond. I was at a hackathon a few weeks ago here in Chicago, where I live, uh, where a group of high school students in just a few hours built their own AI college advisor using data from the, the Department of Education's college scorecard and some open source code. Just the, the sheer explosion of creativity from this first wave of generative AI experiments is so inspiring. And we're learning so much from each other as community members. One of the most important things that we're learning from these early experiments is that generative AI isn't a magic wand that you could just wave at a challenge and have it magically solved. Rather, it's a new, remarkably capable tool that has a lot of promising uses, some clear limitations, and very real potential for harm. The good news is, because it's early days, there's still a lot that you and I can do to tilt the balance toward benefit. So here are some challenges that I think with a little attention and resourcing, we can make a difference in together. The first challenge is the challenge of access. These powerful Gen AI tools 
still require the basics of digital access, a device, a connection to the internet, basic digital literacy. We must continue to invest in bridging the digital divide to ensure universal access to AI tools. Second is the challenge of use. Working with a chatbot is a new class of skills. These skills need to be included in curriculum alongside essential 21st century skills like communication and teamwork in order to prevent a growing AI skills gap. Third is the challenge of bias. Bias can creep into generative AI solutions in a lot of ways, from the underlying data that they're trained on to the code and prompts that go into making a chatbot work. It's already been shown that large language models trained on the internet can have deep implicit biases like doctors all being male and nurses being female. How might a deep bias like that affect a career recommendation AI giving high school students uh, different advice for young men versus young women? It takes constant vigilance to identify and correct for these biases. Lastly is the challenge of control and governance. Who decides what data AI gets access to or what guardrails should be set around its capabilities? Individuals need greater control over how AI uses their data. Communities need governance mechanisms for raising concerns and setting limits. Ultimately, government needs to set good policy to prevent some of the most serious AI risks and disparate impacts from happening. There's a lot of work to be done. It's going to take all of us. There won't be a person on this planet whose life isn't affected by AI. That means we all need a seat at the table and, and real power to shape the future we're racing toward. If we remain AI curious, if we recognize our power by showing up, and perhaps most importantly, if we're willing to share our failures as a community, we will learn faster, make fewer collective mistakes, and ultimately we'll be able to build bots that will, among other things, help millions more skill up users find good jobs. And that sounds like a job worth doing. Thank you. Hello. Uh, let me start with a thank you to the Center for Democracy and Technology and the Stand Together Trust for organizing this conference. As the development of, and use of AI sweeps our collective discourse, it's essential to have spaces like this, spaces to interrogate the risks and the potential harms of using machine learning and artificial intelligence but also spaces to explore the potential benefits of using these tools, the potential benefits of machine, le machine learning for human rights and for supporting human rights defenders around the world. Uh, my name is Dana Ingleton, and I am the executive director of an organization called Curadoc, which stands for Human Rights Information and Documentation Systems. We are an organization, a nonprofit organization that has been working for 40 years to support human rights defenders around the world to collect and systematize and make good use of the information they're collecting about human rights violations to ensure it's effectively used for justice and accountability measures. To do this, we develop strategies for collecting and documenting information, but we also develop our own software, a database called Uwazi, that makes the collection of evidence, laws, and research more accessible to those who are using it to promote and protect human rights. And in recent years, we've been really interested in exploring integrating machine learning into our Uwazi tool as a way to support civil society to sort through and parse increasingly and ever bigger um, data collections at unprecedented speeds. A good example is our partnership with uh, UPR Info. UPR Info is an NGO that supports the realization of human rights through the uh, universal periodic review process at the UN. With them, we have integrated machine learning into the Uwazi database to label and to track the progress of thousands of recommendations um, of voluntary pledges made by UN member states about meeting their obligations. Now, that might not sound like much, but let's talk about the impact. In the past, 
um, documenting everything that has come out of the universal periodic, periodic review cycle, including gathering all the documents, uh, labeling all of the documents, you know, putting them all in the database, et cetera. This process could take up to three months after a cycle. With the use of machine learning in the UWASI software, this process now takes only five days. So you can imagine that the impact of integrating machine learning um, can have it can be huge on those collecting information, understanding huge sets of data for making sure that governments are held to account for their human rights obligations. Another example is the collection of content. All over the world, civil society is collecting and producing and sharing more and more content, whether that's videos or photos or other kinds of data that document human rights violations. In fact, there's ever increasing amounts, more than ever before in human history. A, a good example is in the conflict in Syria. Our partners at the Syrian Archive Project have preserved an estimated 40 years, 40 years of open source video demonstrating and documenting crimes and atrocities. Think about that. That means that if we were to press play on that database right now, we would be watching nonstop until 2063. So as you can imagine, integrating machine learning as a tool that we use for faster and effective labeling and archiving and pattern recognition um, of, the, of the documents that, that civil society are collecting, doing this and adding it to civil society's toolbox, it will be an essential element in ensuring civil society is equipped to go forward into a future where there is certainly not going to be a lack of data, but the whole problem will be making sense of all of that data. Lastly, I would like to also note the importance of making sure that civil society, including, you know, Herodox and all of our partners and everybody else at this conference and people around the world, including them in the debate about accountability and the responsible development of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So while at Herodox, we are you know, happily and very excitedly exploring the use of machine learning, we also want to be part of the conversation about how to do that responsibly, how to make sure that in collecting and parsing and managing all this data, we're not contributing to any issues related to data security or privacy or anything else. And I really look forward to hearing the other talks in this conference, to continuing the conversation in other spaces to make sure that we as a collective civil society are ensuring the responsible development and deployment of these tools. And with that, I would like to say thank you. If anybody would like to speak further about our work uh, using machine learning, our work thinking about the responsible development of it, then please do feel free to reach out. Thank you and have a great day. Hi everyone at the Center for Democracy and Technology Conference, Sal Khan here from Khan Academy. So many of y'all are probably familiar with Khan Academy. We are a not-for-profit organization with a mission of providing a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. So we're big believers and one of our big theories of change is, hey, if we can scale this idea, and right now we have over 150 million registered users, half are in classrooms, half are outside of classrooms, half are domestic, half are international. But if we can allow people the opportunity and incentive to fill in their gaps, give them access to coursework that they might not otherwise have access to, in a lot of the same ways that if you're, if you're a middle or upper middle class family, you would get tutor for your, for your child to address those gaps. Um, or you, you might even be in a position to, to tutor them yourself. That's all the lay of the land before we got to last year. OpenAI reaches out to us, shows us GPT-4. This is nine, six to nine months before the world saw it, three months before uh, ChatGPT came into existence. And ChatGPT, just as a reminder, is not even GPT-4. The one that most people are familiar with, the one that came out in November of 2022, that was GPT-3.5. I was initially skeptical because I had seen GPT-3.5, GPT-3.2. I didn't think it was immediately relevant, but GPT-4, we, it has imperfections, but we realize if we take the proper safeguards and put guardrails around it, that this actually has the potential to take us even further on this journey of scaling tutors uh, for students. And not just tutors for students, but tutors or teaching assistants for teachers. So that's what we immediately started working on. We released Conmigo in March of 2023 at the same time as the GPT-4 launch. And that's exactly what Conmigo's charter is due, is to become a tutor for every student and a teaching assistant for every teacher. And we immediately were very excited about the power, but we had to 
add some extra layers of both guardrails and some capabilities to, to address some of the rough spots of generative AI. We, put all, we have a lot of work in. You'll find that Conmigo is much better at things like math, especially math tutoring, than say just raw GPT-4 out of the box, which is, by the way, the most cutting edge model that, it, that is out there. Uh, and also you'll see that Conmigo is anchored on Khan Academy content, which reduces the error problem, the, the, the incorrect information, what's often known as the hallucination problem. Now, above and beyond that, there's obviously fears around what if students get into unconstructive conversations or try to cheat. So Conmigo does not cheat. It's all about a Socratic dialogue. Uh, and we can give you more examples of that. You know, when you ask Conmigo, why, do, why should I care about this? It says, well, what do you care about? Or if, if I ask Conmigo, uh, you know, how does this work? It says, well, tell me what you know about it so far. And then it will ask leading questions and then fill in blanks as necessary, which, which is very, uh, uh, we think, very good pedagogy. But above and beyond that, especially for under 18 students, every interaction that students have with the AI is transparent to parents and teachers. We have a second artificial intelligence that monitors the conversations. And if it deems that any of them are going into shady or unproductive directions, it actively notifies uh, the parents and teachers to make sure that we have optimum safety and optimum transparency. And so where we see this going, already people can go on Conmigo. If they're having uh, needing help with an exercise, say, on Khan Academy, it won't give them the answer. It will Socratically help nudge them in the right direction. It can go further than that. It can emulate historical characters. It can engage in debates with students. It can act as an academic or career coach. It can help them with essays, where once again, it's not going to write the essay for the student, but it can give them feedback, much as an ethical uh, writing coach would. And on that point, we actually think this is the way to address the cheating issue that ChatGPT has introduced. If, if all that educators index on is the output, the essay itself, then yes, yeah, students are going to be able to go to chat GPT or wherever and generate an essay. It's going to be very hard to detect. But if students instead are assigned to do their essays with Conmigo, then Conmigo will be part of the process. They can riff together. They can brainstorm. And then Conmigo can report to the teacher not just the final output, but actually how the student got there. It can tell the teacher things like, hey, we worked for about four hours. Um, we, we, had, we went back and forth on what a good thesis statement was. I pushed the student a bit on making sure that a certain reference they got was a legitimate one. And not only can it do that, but it can also be a real teaching assistant for the teacher beyond that, helping teachers create lesson plans, helping teachers create rubrics, as I just mentioned, giving a first pass on grading. And this is just, I think, the, the, the very top of the first inning uh, of what we're doing. And what we're trying to do is Lean into it, but do it in the most responsible and thoughtful way. For example, above and beyond the safeguards I just said, no personally identifiable information goes between Conmigo and the underlying model. None of the student's information is being used to train the underlying model because we want to make sure that we can show that we can have very positive use cases from generative AI that don't um, hit into those gray areas that a lot of folks are appropriately concerned about. And in the coming months and years, you're going to see more and more power here, both on the teacher and the student and actually the parent side to keep them all in the loop and to maximize the amount of learning that happens. We're actually starting our first wave of real efficacy studies. Uh, we already have good indication it's definitely not doing harm and it's definitely increasing engagement, but we want to show that how it can actually impact real, uh, real student learning. You're going to see even more, hopefully, richness of the tutoring experience where the AI is able to remember, say, a student's interest. But we can make or um, remember what they covered last week, but at the same time, make that information transparent and um, essentially modifiable by the teachers and students. So if the AI builds an inference on the student, they can see the inferences and they can say, no, you can reset that. I don't, I'm not into soccer anymore. Or actually, I've mastered that concept off platform. The real power happens when you have the generative AI tutor with all of these safeguards we've talked about, but it's connected to all of the stakeholders, especially for under 18 students, the students, the parents, and the teachers. Great, thank you all so much to our Lightning Talk speakers for sharing what they're working on and what they're thinking about. Um, we hope you enjoyed hearing from them. And as a reminder, all of the videos will be available after the event on youtube.com slash senddemtech. And now for our last session of the day, I'm delighted to hang things over to Samir Jain, CDT's Vice President of Policy for a discussion on what legal frameworks might or should shape the development of generative AI. Samir, over to you. 
Great. Thanks, Emma. Uh, welcome to all of you in the audience for this, our final panel of this year's Freedom of Online Speech event. As Emma noted, the focus of our panel is going to be what a liability framework for generative AI should look like. We'll be talking about questions such as what are we trying to accomplish through liability? Who should be responsible in what circumstances? Should the rules look like what those we have today, such as Section 230, or do we need something different? To help us begin to answer some of these questions, we have a distinguished group of panelists joining us today. First, Ari Cohn. Ari is a free speech counsel at Tech Freedom, a nonpartisan nonprofit think tank devoted to technology, law, and policy and the preservation of civil liberties. He has a decade of experience defending free speech and is a nationally recognized expert in First Amendment law, defamation law, and Section 230. He regularly advocates before policymakers and also maintains a private law practice in which he defends individual clients against claims aimed at punishing the exercise of First Amendment rights. Next, Ellen Goodman. Ellen is a distinguished professor of law at Rutgers Law School, where she specializes in information policy law. Her research interests include algorithmic governance, freedom of expression, platform policies, and transparency. She is co-director and co-founder of the Rutgers Institute for Information Policy and Law. Recently, Professor Goodman has been on leave to serve as senior advisor for algorithmic justice at NTIA at the, at the U.S. Department of Commerce. She has also served as a senior fellow at the uh, German Marshall Fund, as a distinguished visiting scholar at the FCC, and as a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania and the London School of Economics. Finally, James Grimmelman. James is the Tesler Family Professor of Digital and Information Law at Cornell Tech and Cornell Law School, and a fellow at the GL Information Society Project. He studies how laws regulating software affect freedom, wealth, and power. He's the author of a case book called Internet Law, and uh, over 50 scholarly essays and articles on a host of tech policy issues. Before law school, he worked as a programmer at Microsoft, and he's previously taught at New York Law School, Georgetown, and the University of Maryland. We'll take time at the end of this panel to respond to audience questions, but you can pose your questions at any time. Just as a reminder, if you're connecting through Zoom, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the window. If you're following on the live stream, you could submit questions via email to questions at cdt.org or via Twitter at sendemtech using pound CDT questions or pound FOSO 2023. With that, let's dive in. Just to set the table, before we start talking about what a liability regime should look like, let's talk about two of the key current laws and how they might apply to generative AI. The key law that currently addresses liability for many online harms is Section 230. With some exceptions, Section 230 generally immunizes interactive service providers from liability for third-party content, where such liability would treat the service provider as the publisher or speaker of that content. Under the terms of the statute, a key threshold to qualify for immunity is that the service provider may not have even a partial role in the creation or development of the content and issue. So given current court interpretations of 230, um, why don't I start with you, Professor Goodman? How do you think Section 230 may apply to generative AI? Thanks, Samir. Call me Ellen, please. Um, so, well, we're we're about a year into this, and already you've seen opinions um, change pretty quickly. So, let me just sort of run through that chronology. Um, I, you know, in the first part of 2023, I think there was a general view um, that Section 230 would not apply, and you heard that from. Sam Altman in his testimony, I think it was in April, um, you heard it from former Congressman um, Cox and, and Senator Wyden, the authors of Section 230. Um, and I think the reason for that, um, and I myself had that view, um, the reason for that is because, you know, as we know how LLMs work, um, they are statistical predictors of the next word or the next image. And so um, they are not mashing up third party um, uh, content, but rather generating something new. So that was um, the reason why people thought it wouldn't apply. And the early cases, you know, what people were looking at were sort of um, hallucinations of def defamatory um, content and then a few other kinds of uh, speech harms. Um, I, I guess I should start out by saying what Section 230 does, which is um, it says that an interactive computer service shall not be held liable as a publisher or speaker of third party content. So we're, it's really that last piece that we're looking at. The other two are not are not particularly high um, barriers. 
Second impressions kind of made things more complicated. Um, and, and James Gremlinman is, is the person to hear about, hear from on that point. But, um, you know, obviously there's the role of prompting. And so you do have a third party involved in creating the content. Um, there's also the role of uh, sort of fine tuning as models um, are incorporated in downstream applications. And we just heard on the last panel from Nicholas um, that, you know, there may, we may be moving to a world where there's less and less prompting. And so, um, you know, there's just a lot of variability in terms of the role of third parties and interconnected models. Um, so I think big picture answer is there are reasons to think that Section 230 will not apply as it has applied to digital platforms, but there are also reasons to be cautious in predicting how courts um, will rule on any particular instance given the, the variations in the roles of third parties and the roles of the models. James, Ellen called you out. Do you, do you generally agree or do you have any further uh, thoughts on that? I generally agree with that. I think that a lot of the concern is going to be that sometimes models memorize their inputs and sometimes models change their inputs. And when models memorize their inputs, they are passing through content that came from some specific source. So if the model includes data scraped from the web and it outputs that data unchanged from where it was, and that's a privacy violation, then Section 230 is going to apply there. The harder parts come when the models change their inputs to synthesize data from multiple sources, and there's not one clear third-party content being presented, or when they fabricate data that they present things that are not grounded to any specific source. There they have drawn on general knowledge, but in the language of one important court decision, they have contributed materially to the illegality of their outputs. I think Ellen is also exactly right that when the content comes from a user's prompt, then that is actually third party content within the meaning of judicial interpretations of 230. So it's going to be very complicated and very model and case specific. James, let me stick with you. One of the exceptions to 230 is for intellectual property. And in the case of copyright, we've actually got a very different regime uh, through the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that governs liability. Um, talk to us briefly about what does the what is the basic framework for liability under the DMCA? And then how do you think that applies in the context of generative AI? So Section 512 of the Copyright Act, added by the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, provides a series of safe harbors for internet intermediaries. The most famous of them is the 512C soft safe harbor for content hosted at the direction of the user. This is the safe harbor that applies to example, YouTube videos. Users upload them, YouTube stores and distributes them to others. It's hard to fit most generative AI into that safe harbor because they are not hosting content at user's direction. They have trained models based upon data they went out and gathered themselves and were responsible for collecting and putting online. And the resulting outputs, to the extent they infringe copyright, are really being stored and transmitted at the direction of the model and its users. But the users aren't the one who uploaded the infringing content in the first place. They're the recipients of it. Uh, so it is a very bad fit for Section 512C. There might be some cases where a model is trained on user prompts and the users have deliberately typed it into the model in order to provide it there. But even that involves some interpretive stretches. So by and large, I tend to think 512 is not going to be a terribly strong shield for these services. Okay, great. So. We've talked a little bit about current law where 512 maybe isn't a good fit, Section 230 may or may not, depending on the particular facts. But let's turn now to the question of what a liability regime for Gen AI should look like going forward if we're able to um, create that. And let me start sort of with a threshold question for you, Ari. As we think about what an accountability regime should look like, what are the, some of the harms or some of the harm scenarios that gen a, gen, generative AI could produce for which we might want to assign liability or some other form of accountability? What, what, should, what, what are some of the cases that we should have in mind as we're thinking about how do we construct a liability regime? 
Yeah, I think, you know, at the outset, when we're thinking about a liability regime for Gen AI, one of the things just overarching that we got to remember is that the human capacity to misuse tools is absolutely endless and unpredictable. Uh, it would be unreasonable and impossible to expect Gen AI uh, providers to account for every single thing. That's not to say we shouldn't think about you know, some of the most predictable issues, but we're never going to catch them all. So we, we kind of have to, to keep that in mind. There are a few different types of harms, um, and I, I'll, I'll stay top level right now before going into causes of actions. I think it's useful to think about it in the who is harmed way. So you can think about it from the defamation angle. Um, if Gen AI spits out something that says I was convicted of, you know, murdering puppies or something, uh, that could be defamatory. It would hurt me. Uh, it would hurt me to, uh, at, in that my reputation to others uh, has been damaged. Now, there's also, say, a situation, I know Meta just introduced either today or yesterday, some Gen AI tools for advertisers. Um, and I don't know what they look like, so I'm kind of going based on what I think they might look like. But say, but say those tools allow an advertiser to cr basically create ad copy for users. Um, that could actually harm both the advertiser and the public, uh, potentially. The advertiser could end up with ad copy that says something completely ridiculous, potentially defamatory or, or what have you, about their own product. So there's, there's that angle. And then there's the angle, well, maybe the ad copy says something fraudulent and somebody from, you know, who received the advertisement relies on that. And, and buys a product or is hurt by a product or, or something like that. So you have that angle. And then you also have perhaps the issue of, say, one of these tools is rolled out for use in employment or some kind of uh, situation where there is legally actionable uh, you know, laws against discrimination. So uh, maybe Gen AI spits out a summary of candidates that ends up being discriminatory in some uh, way. So then you actually, again, you actually have a situation where it could harm the user of the Gen AI itself, the company who's then subject to liability potentially for uh, some kind of dis actionable discrimination. But even more importantly, you might have hurt the job applicants who are protected from that discrimination. So there's just, there's a lot of different ways, and, and I can say without a doubt in my mind that we will find new ways to be harmed by this. Um, and as the technology develops, these, these new approaches and these the new uses for these tools will create additional categories of harms. Those are a few top level examples that I you know, can think of that we should be thinking about how to deal with. Um James, as we're thinking about some of those kinds of harms that Ari is thinking, what are we? What are our goals for a liability regime? What should our goals be? I mean, one obvious one is potentially compensating the victim of a harm. Um, but what what else do we need to bear in mind as we're thinking about a liability regime in terms of what we're trying to accomplish? So one obvious and important goal of a regime is to induce AI companies to take cost justified precautions that they should when they are able to improve their models and their systems so that these harms don't happen. And this can happen through viability that forces them to internalize the costs, which they can then weigh against the benefits that they make. This is a classic economic argument for internalizing these costs. And part of the argument is that in some cases, the AI companies will be the ones who are best positioned to prevent the harm. They have much better knowledge of their models than the users do, and therefore they can identify where the models are producing bias or false information as outputs. They can retrain them or fine tune them or do filtering to try to prevent some of those harms. They're just positioned because they have so much better information on how the models work than others. That's not going to lead to universal liability because there are plenty of cases where people are using AI systems as tools to engage in harms. And the user is the one who is trying to drive the illegality. And the AI system is amplifying them in a way that it amplifies lots of people's uses. And the AI system has a hard time figuring out which of those users are going to be the ones who drive that. So there's sort of overall social cost minimization. Uh, another slightly subtler goal 
is information forcing. We don't really understand how these systems work, even inside these companies. And on a societal level, we understand them even less. And a liability regime is actually one of the ways that our society uses to figure out what's going on inside complicated enterprises and complicated technologies in a way that helps us make better policy. So a good system would actually educate judges and educate the public uh, about what these systems do right, what they do wrong. Ellen, Ari, other goals that you think we should bear in mind as we're thinking about liability regimes? Well, despite my misgivings of law and economics generally, um, I mean, I, James is James is exactly right that it, it comes down to a balancing act uh, between what kind of preventative measures are going to are best placed at the feet of the companies in terms of, uh, you know, ability, knowledge, and cost. Uh, and that's how tort law works generally. So it's not exactly a, a, a new thing. So I, I think he he really hit the nail on the head with that. So Ellen, let, let me ask you, you described for us earlier how Section 230 might apply as it currently stands. But what about, um, let's step back and ask, is Section 230 or something like it the regime we should be thinking about for generative AI? Or is should we be looking at some other kind of a model? Is, is Section 230 the right model for, for generative AI? I love this question. And before I answer it, let me clarify and make clear, as I should have done at the beginning, that I'm speaking for myself um, in my academic capacity and not for um, the government. Um, OK, I'm going to let me wind up a little bit just before I get to um, an answer to that question, Samir. And I, um, you know, I think, first of all, it's important to say there already are liability regimes for generative AI, right? There already are laws that apply um, when when there are harms um, that result from the use of generative AI and the, you know, in law enforcement agencies have been um, sort of quick to say that they will enforce fraud, whether it comes from a generative AI or any other AI system or whether it doesn't. And, and the same is true for, you know, medical malpractice and um, employment discrimination and, and, you know, other things for which we have laws. So let's take sort of, and, and I, I do want to call out, you know, Alex Engler at, at Brookings has a really nice paper on you know, sort of modest proposals for what it would take for sector specific um, regulatory agencies and law to be more effective in the AI space. And, you know, one of the suggestions is sort of more subpoena power and more socio technical resources um, to, to sort of deal with with um, uh, the, the documentation that that those subpoenas would um, would yield. Um, the, the sort of second like um uh stem winder that i want to give is that you know most of the many of the harms that we're concerned about have been concerned about with digital platforms you know although we've talked about section 230 you know they are not actionable even if we didn't have section 230 right so um that goes for um hate speech and and um misinformation disinformation um polarizing radicalizing speech so in most cases those are not actionable so it's just hard to imagine a like any liability regime um that would be consistent with the first amendment so i think we kind of have to um, cabin our expectations with respect to what liability regimes can do vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, some of the central harms, uh, at least communications related harms. I mean, the, and the last thing I'll say just generally is that I think what, um, and you heard uh, in the last panel, this talk about um, autonomous agents. And so the integration of large language models and autonomous agents and sort of the breaching of the digital physical divide, I think puts a lot of pressure on this distinction between speech and conduct. And so, you know, as we kind of imagine what liability is going to look like, even though I just said a lot of the speech isn't actionable, I think we're going to have much more kind of mixed speech and conduct. And that's going to just be, um, uh, you know, I think require kind of new thinking about where the line is between speech and conduct and where the what the First Amendment protects. Um, and so some of the things that I think large language, I think the the, the sort of um, attack surface uh, fr from the law's perspective might grow um, for these sector specific regulations because speech is going to be imported into con 
conduct, if that makes sense. All right. Now, to answer your question, um, you know, the two things I would say, I, I don't think Section 230, um, if we if we had to do it over again, would we have adopted Section 230 in, you know, in 19 in 1996? Not sure. We know a lot more now about sort of the vulnerabilities of society to, um, you know, frictionless uh algorithmically charged communication. So I'm not sure that's the right way to go here. Um, but more generally than that, you know, I think there the, the common law, we never gave the common law the chance to respond to the sort of balance that we wanted to strike between fast innovation and kind of, let's just call it like public safety. Um, we didn't let common law even see if it could get to the right answer um, because section 230 came in and kind of short circuited that. So I would like to see what the common law does in this area. And the other thing we never really tried in the digital space was ex ante regulation. Um, you know, we know kind of what it looked like in the FCC domain. We don't know what it looks like in, in the algorithmic um, or digital domain. And if we have time, you know, maybe we can talk about some things that it might do, you know, in conjunction um, with ex post common law. Ari right, James, let me bring you into the conversation. Is Section 230 the right model here for generative AI, or should, as Ellen is suggesting, maybe we look at common law or something else? I think Section 230 is a really terrible model for generative AI. I mean, Section 230 is designed to deal with the problem of collateral censorship. When speech intermediaries fear that if they are subject to liability for the content they'll carry, they'll shut down the innocent content along with the beneficial content. And the really crucial feature of that is that they're carrying lots of stuff being sent to them by third parties. And the third parties care about this content and they know about it and they can make themselves a balance is, you know, is this true and useful or is this false and defamatory? And the intermediary doesn't know this content from anything. It has no context. And so therefore it will over censor. Generative AI companies are just not in that position with respect to the content they're trying to learn from and synthesize. If we treat them as being hands-off for the quality of their outputs, there's no incentive for them to investigate the outputs that cause harms for anyone besides the users. The users will push them to you know, not make bad recommendations and give me accurate information on trying to get legal citations. but the generative AI companies will not take into account all of the harms they're causing to third parties. And the over-censorship rationale just doesn't work in this context. These systems are too complicated and too nuanced, too intricate for a really broad brush flat regime like 230 to work. We need a viability regime or a regulatory regime that lets us make more nuanced judgments about particular systems in particular cases, distinguishing ones that are, this is something good we should encourage from this is out to cause harm and is causing significant harm. And if we have a system that cuts off those inquiries at the outset, we never get any better at the process of filtering the good stuff from the bad stuff. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say- you Conversation, yeah, go ahead. I'll say that I, I on the record, Knowing what I know now, I will still pass Section 230 in this the year 2023, um, just my perspective. But I also agree with James' shift of the locus of what the, the purpose of the law is and who, who the actors are and exactly what they are doing. Um, I think it is questionable in a lot of circumstances whether Section 230 even you know, provides the the protection that uh, it does for, say, a social media platform for, for Gen AI producers um, for various reasons, including the, the material contributions test that, that was discussed earlier. Um, and so I, I think we are already in large part in the realm of, okay, we have to figure out how tort law kind of coincides with this and, and figure out how existing doctrines fit. Um, but I, I do think that it, that James is right to point out, it's not a clean fit. Uh, what Gen AI companies are doing is not the same as the type of activities that Section 230 was aimed at protecting. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we say Section 230 never covers Gen AI. 
Um, Because I think there are certainly circumstances we can all imagine where it should. Um, And I I think maybe one of those uh, uh, situations is maybe illustrated by, and this is just take, for example, that Gen AI is doing this, take that for granted, when you do a Google search and it gives you kind of a a snippet of information from a site uh, as kind of like a quick answer, that is closer to, not closer, is exactly the type of thing that 230 would, would, you know, is intended to protect. But when you get to, uh, I'm asking this Gen AI uh, program, what, you know, X, Y, and Z are, and it's going and it is pulling things from various different places and it is synthesizing it, as I think both James and Ellen have, have referred to this, the information. That's a, that's a much different question. That is the production of new material effectively. Maybe that's different if after each particular, you know, claim, there is a citation to the information that came from. Maybe that makes a difference. Maybe it doesn't. Um, You know, I I, I wish I had all the answers, but I I just don't. Um, But I I think there are are different applications of Gen AI that are going to warrant different approaches. So you've all raised the specter of tort law as an alternative or common law as an alternative. Let's let's, uh, explore that a little bit further in the sense of, you know, with tort law, we have some basic questions that we always need to answer things like, you know, is there a duty of care? What 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 is reasonable? Um, you know, there are doctrines of secondary liability uh, in tort law as well. As we st- let's think a little bit about how how does that work? You know, if if a user goes in and um, you know asks generative AI for uh, help with diagnosing um, their medical condition, which we know people use search engines for all the time, and the generative AI comes back with the wrong diagnosis that leads the user to do something that ends up physically harming them because they rely on that generative AI. Is that, uh, you know, did the generative AI have a duty of care to produce accurate information? Was the, is there, um, how should we think about potential tort liability in that kind of a context? I throw that open for any of you to start jumping in. So I'm going to nerd out for a second here, because uh, it's a really interesting question. Um, and I'm going to start with duty of care. Uh, generally speaking, publishers do not have a duty of care to protect people from harmful effects of quote unquote, bad information. And you see this with things like field, you know, somebody sees the publisher of a field guide to mushrooms that identified a very non-edible mushroom as edible. uh, And the publisher isn't liable. There is some question as to whether the author could be liable. And that raises the interesting question of whether Gen AI is more like a publisher or an author. And to that question, I have absolutely no answer. Um, Who knows? This is just completely new uh, material for for pretty much all of us. Um, But take a a defamation uh, situation. I ask Gen AI what, you know, what is Samir Jane's background? And it comes up with something completely wild and and defamatory. So if if it ends there, there's not really a defamation claim to begin with unless I maybe have like, and in, in some way empowered to harm your life and cause you some kind of quantifiable damages, um, then, you know, the chances of a one user getting bad information from Gen AI being actionable in terms of damages is probably somewhat low. They're obviously outlier circumstances. But say I'm a reporter, and then I report that. Well, then there's a question of, you know, and we'll assume you're a public figure for this one. Um, did I act with actual malice because I took this information from Gen AI, which is known to hallucinate without trying to verify it in any way? Is that such a radical departure from journalistic standards and norms that I can be deemed to have been reckless as to the truth or falsity? I think there's a, a decent case that the answer to that question is yes, uh, given what we know now about the state of generative AI. If you're a private figure, you only have to show negligence. And maybe it's unlikely that I'm writing about you as a private figure, perhaps, but uh, maybe then it's easier. Uh, But then there's the question, there's just question after question here of what kind of negligence or intent, as the case may be in other claims, does Gen AI have? 
What can it have? What can it possess? Is, can there be an intent to defraud coming from Gen AI? I'm not sure that, I mean, I think it's obvious that the Gen AI itself can't. I don't know that you can actually transfer that intent over to the programmer and say, well, you know, there was, they had some kind of nefarious plot to defame Samir Jane or defraud Samir uh, when they programmed this. And I think that get, it all comes back, I think, to a, a negligence concept. Uh, as James was saying, you know, the, the standard approach of negligence claims is, well, who is the, the least cost avoider of this issue uh, and who had the knowledge to, to defray it? And maybe that leads to some kind of change in the standard duty of care analysis, where we do start maybe shifting uh, a little bit past the fear that a duty of care will prevent publishers from publishing anything other than the most safe and anodyne ideas to we're not really concerned that AI itself is going to stop producing valuable ideas. That's really a different, uh, a different approach, a different concern. Um, and I, I think one of the other interesting questions, and I'll, I'll shut up in a second, is the with whether the user knows or the, the recipient, the ultimate recipient of the information knows that it was created by Gen AI. So in fraud, you have you know, a requirement generally, there's a justifiable reliance. If I am asking Gen AI to diagnose my medical concern, I don't think there's anyone that can say I would I could justifiably rely on Gen AI, any more than I could justifi justifiably rely on like Web WebMD to, you know, tell me whether or not I have cancer. Um, but does that change, Ari, if, if it's the Mayo Clinic on its website um, offering this up and sort of suggesting that you go there? Well, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't think it necessarily does. If you go to, to the Mayo Clinic website and you look up the symptoms of, of cancer generally, as people do and freak out about, um, and you say, well, now I have cancer and I need to, you know, do X, Y, and Z. I, I don't think that that's a, a justifiable reliance, even though it came from the Mayo Clinic. I think the interesting question is more of, say, again, an advertiser uses Meta's tools and creates ad copy for particular audiences, and it happens to be quite fraudulent. The end user, the end recipient, actually only knows that it came from the advertiser, not that there was that Gen AI step in the middle. And in that situation, I think reliance becomes more justifiable just on a, on a facial level. So I think then you get into interesting questions of, okay, if, if the person who read it doesn't know how it came to be, then maybe the ultimate originator of that information has more liability exposure. So, Alan James, I want, to, I want to bring you into the conversation. As you think about tort liability and some of these basic questions of reliance and reasonable care and things like that, how, other thoughts you have on how we might think about that in generative AI context? The main thing I want to contribute is that the focus on mental states in tort law becomes incredibly distracting when you have AI. And unfortunately, that's the direction the Supreme Court has been going with speech torts and crimes to increasingly require heightened mental stat awareness of the falsity or risks of one's speech. And that just breaks down completely for AI systems because the, the AI system itself doesn't have mental states on our current beliefs about how they work. And the people who run the system have very complex mental states about how the system works. And I teach a class, case in my internet law course about Con Ed shutting off the power to a house by mistake. And they do this because their computer system had some data put in in a way that didn't line up with the fact that it was a house being built. And you know, I first leave my students on this long 10 minute wild goose chase trying to run down who inside Con Ed is responsible for it. Is it the guy who actually disconnects the power? Is it the data entry clerk? Is it the person who reads the computer outputs and then sends the order to disconnect power? Is it the programmer? Is it some executive? And then I said, forget all of that, step back. Imagine that Con Ed is just a guy named Ed and he does all of it. And Ed cuts off power when he shouldn't. Does it matter whether Ed had a computer in his office? No, 
the system as a whole, the company is responsible for what it does. And it has to behave reasonably what given what people told its agents and what its agents did. And to some extent, that's the approach you have to take with a Gen AI system. You have to ignore, in terms of the operator's liability, the fact that it's using computers and focus on the quality of the information that presents the basis that it has for presenting that information and any warning signs that the information might be wrong. Now, computers might become relevant when you look at the users. The user who knows that this is coming from chat GPT might be expected to exercise more caution than a user who's seeing this posted on a website of the Mayo Clinic or reading it in a pharmacology textbook. But that goes to the how people perceive it. And those are very hard questions that are totally in flux right now because we're learning in real time what these say, systems are good at and what they're not. Ellen, I want to... Yeah, I mean, I, I, at this point, I think I have more questions than I have more answers. I'm sort of, you know, tr trying to puzzle through some of these things. And I think, you know, what James said is, is, is a reason, maybe a reason to have strict liability in some contexts. And I think, um, and that's what the Europeans are considering. Um, and, you know, you have... I think what they're working through in their AI liability directive is, you know, strict liability in for for some kinds of um, systems and some kinds of harms, and then you have kind of um, combine that with an ex ante regime of regulatory sandboxing so that they get to kind of launch these soft launch these systems. Um, without fear of liability. And then that gives, in terms of the information forcing function, it gives everyone, society, a chance to kind of, and, and regulators a chance to kind of see um, what the risks are and figure out what kind of information and disclosures they want to require. Um, in the absence of that, or maybe if we're talking about strict liability at the deployment or any kind of liability at the deployment rather than at the developer or model stage, I mean, in many ways, that makes a lot more sense, right? It's, it's It would be hard to justify, I think, holding, you know, open AI strictly liable for some tort that happens once ChatGPT is integrated into some downstream system and plus it gets like fine tuned and adapted. And, you know, it really is not, um, it's it's not just that it's not foreseeable, it's that it's, it would be very difficult to sort of um, incentivize them. The, the deterrence effect would be pretty, um, I think, dilute. And so, you know, in some ways it looks, it makes more sense, I think, to focus on the deployers, but then there's an information problem because while they know the context in which they're deploying, they don't know if that's the appropriate context. The other, another sort of question I'll raise um, is that, you know, and I'm not a tort expert, but I think, um, you know, sort of duty of care um, and acceptable standards of care, first of all, as, as Elham Tabassi said on the last panel, you know, really the, the work of NIST and kind of scientific measurement and research is critical there for to like, you know, inform what, what that standard should be and what's reasonable. Um, but, uh, uh, Oh my gosh, I just lost my train of thought on, um, oh yes. Um, you know, I think it's possible to have a system that, you know, depending on how we define what's reasonable, that passes the reasonableness test for most people. But we know that in these AI systems that, you know, they, they're they the training data um, to the extent that it is not reflective of reality uh, is going to um, uh, mean that the harms are more acutely felt by certain communities that are not well represented in the in the data. And so I do worry about, you know, kind of tort ideals of reasonableness, um, if they're sort of smoothed out over the whole population, will kind of um, not be re sufficiently remedial for communities that suffer the most harm. I would add, I'm, I'm, I would be very concerned about a strict liability regime. Um, the Europeans do lots of stuff that I find a little bit crazy, but I think particularly they're a little bit less litigious than we are. Um, and, you know, say what you will about Section 230, but there's a reason a lot of these tech, tech advances are coming from here and not Europe. Um, so, you know, I, I'd, be, I'd be really worried about cutting off potentially very useful uh, Gen AI developments by imposing a strict liability. Um, if we're going to do something different, I, th I think... 
personally, I'm more towards the maybe creating categories of harm and assessing how much a company might have done testing for that particular category of harm, assess the risk, whether it was in fact the least cost avoider, the, the typical, you know, is there a duty type uh, analysis that we do in current tort law uh, under a negligence standard. Um, but I, I, you know, that for me, that's probably the more fruitful avenue because frankly, I don't think strict liability is gonna um, get through the, the courts or legislatures here either. My crazy position is that I'm okay with strict liability or with negligence. I just think all of the intermediate positions that turn on mental states, recklessness, knowledge, and intent, those are the ones that are unworkable. So let me let me um, draw out one of the points, Ellen, that you started hinting at, which is, is that when we're ta talking about Gen, Gen AI, there are a lot of different actors here. I mean, there's the developer of the model. There may be a different entity that creates the chatbot or the other application. It may be another entity that deploys the chatbot in a particular context. As we've talked about, we've got the user. And one of the questions for a liability regime is how do we allocate responsibility and liability across all of these different actors? Is contract law and indemnification the right approach for that? Or is there some other, or are there dangers to that? Or is there some other way to think about allocation of liability? Ellen, you want to start? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think those are all um, absolutely fine, but they operate against a default, right, of, of um, uh, who has power in the system because who do we think will be held, you know, is most likely to be held liable. So, you know, I mean, I, I think that can be, that's, I do think the strength of the common law is that we can start to see, you know, who gets held liable. And then I quickly think we'll see, um, you know, at reallocations of responsibility through um, contract law. I think the contracts and indemnification can work in certain kinds of supply chains. So they can work when you have a system built on top of a model that's been licensed. One thing that makes that harder is that there are many steps in the generative AI supply chain where people are dealing at the arm's length through open release models of data sets. So they train on things like common crawl, which is just a crawl of the entire web. And it's anybody can pick it up and train on it. And there are some models that are released uh, just as a set of weights to the public, and anybody can deploy that model in their own system. It gets much harder to use contract and indemnification in those kinds of relationships. Okay. Just a reminder for the audience, we're coming to the end. So if you have questions, feel free to um, drop them into the Q&A um, or uh, send, them, uh, send them if you're on the live stream to... Uh, questions at cdt.org. Um, James, I, we talked about copyright at the very beginning, and I want to make sure we return to it. You, you made clear you thought that 512 is not the right answer. Um, is general copyright liability as it generally applies the right approach here for copyright liability, or is there special, is generative AI special in the copyright context? Generative AI is a very weird position. Just everything's up for grabs. Because so many stages of creating a generative AI model involve wholesale copying of complete works, it is, to some extent, if you held everybody liable for those with no fair use defense, you would bring the entire system crashing down. Generative AI exists in the United States because we have a set of decisions and assumptions that fair use protects a lot of these activities. Those decisions came from pre-Gen AI world. They might not hold up. There are other countries that have very specifically defined exceptions in their copyright laws for text and data mining. So one possibility is the United States would come to something more like the EU has in which there are specific legislative carve-outs that protect certain activities. It's entirely possible also that either Congress or the courts might wind up recreating something like the DMCA system for generative AI it requires companies to act upon certain kinds of notices of copyright infringement in their training data or their outputs. But it's a gigantic up for grabs question right now. Um, other thoughts from Ari or Ellen on the copyright question? Well, I'll just jump in. I, I think this applies to copyright. I think it applies to some of the sort of other externalities or, or you know, end of work concerns. Um, 
Uh, it also applies to news generation. So, you know, all of these kind of areas that we're worried about being hurt um, by generative AI. And we started out, you know, I think James said, we're, we're talking about the three goals of tort law and the first one being, um, uh, you know, compensation to the harmed. And I think, you know, we're probably not going to be in a situation where tort law is going to provide um, the kinds of compensation for these externalized harms um, that, you know, we, I mean, society might might want. And I think, um, which leads to something, you know, we've talked about with digital platforms over the years, but never instituted, which is, and I know people are talking about it in, in the copyright context, which is a levy system or some other kind of, um, you know, development of funds. I mean, in a sense, it's UBI, right? But for, but for not just for individuals, but for like, um, Uh, parts of society, maybe a different direction, not tort law, um, not ex ante regulation, although it would require ex ante regulation. But um, I do think we need to start thinking about what should, um, and, and I don't know if it's just the big, you know, the big five or some other um, more distributed source of, um, of support, but, but how do we start funding um, the injured? Are there models, existing models out there that do that in other contexts, do you know, Ellen? Or is this something we'd be creating for generative AI? I mean, I think there are there are lots of there are levy models, um, you know, in 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 copyright, in other um in, in other systems, um, you know, uh, but uh, but there are like, yeah, there are funds. I mean, any kind of UBI or any kind of, um, uh, you know, tax on industry, super fund, right? <laughs> tax on industry, um, you know, to fund a public good. Um, and in some ways, I think the the the, the link taxes in, um, not that I'm supportive of them, but the link taxes in Australia and Canada, you know, to support news um, is kind of a version of that. And that raises another question that um, we should probably touch on. I mean, we've been focused uh, largely on the United States and sort of U.S. tort law and Section 230 and U.S. law. But, Ellen, a couple of times you've pointed to, you know, the EU is looking at this and the AI Act and there are other countries, you know, many other countries looking at this. To what degree should we be trying to come up with a liability regime that is consistent in some sense across countries or does it matter? Should we just be worried about U.S. law and figuring that out under U.S. law and not be paying too much attention to what's going on in Europe or other places? Or is there a need to have some sort of consistency? If, if that's for me, I mean, I, you know, global government would be nice. But, um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't think we're going to get there because um, as someone said on the last panel, um, you know, we don't we don't have agreement on the on the on the underlying norms. Um, but, uh, and, and look, I mean, I think being a pragmatist and, you know, I think we all have lots of ideas for federal legislation that we might like to see, um, that under, you know, existing political circumstances, we're just not going to get there. And so like where government works, um, you know, and we haven't had that in digital because 230 has preempted for the most part, um, state state legislation. I mean, you know, I'm not a fan of the net choice, um, the underlying state laws that are going up to the Supreme Court in the net choice cases. But one could imagine, you know, the opposite of what you're suggesting, a, a fragmentation in the United States of um, of AI regulation. Um, and it, I, I don't think it's desirable, but I think it might be where we are. Yeah, given where Congress is. It's <laughs> well, I'll, I'll push back slightly on that. And maybe not insofar as regulation goes, but one of the benefits to exploring common law liability, as some people say that we missed out on Section 230, I would dispute that, um, is that, you know, it could develop in different ways in different states and, and give some flavor to a regulatory scheme somewhere down the line should one be warranted. Um, I don't know how much I agree with that. I'm, you know, purely playing devil's advocate because I'm committed to only asking questions and not giving answers. <laughs> Great. Well, we've uh, come to the end of our time. So um, let me close by, first of all, thanking the three of you for uh, really engaging an insightful panel. 
I think raising a lot of questions um, appropriately because I think we're all struggling to figure out the answers. So, um, so appreciate that. And more generally, um, since this is the final panel for FOSO this year, I wanted to th really thank all of our speakers for the past two days for um, their thoughtful and provocative remarks. Give us, you know, we're, we're all exploring this together at the front, front end. So I think these kinds of gatherings um, really can help us, you know, spur thought and start to move toward developing some agreement and consensus around certain issues. And I wanna thank the audience for your participation, for your attention, for, um, you know, for listening and hopefully gaining some insights through the, um, through the program. Uh, just a reminder, if there were sessions that you missed and you want to go back and uh, catch, you can do that on our uh, YouTube channel, youtube.com slash senddemtech, and uh, all of the sessions will, will be there uh, in recorded form, and so you can catch that. Uh, with that, uh, thanks again to everyone, and uh, good luck and goodbye. Thanks. Bye.